Guys, welcome back to the Arsenio Buck Show. Man, today, oh, it's going to be a good one because I got my Wakanda people on here. You know what I'm saying? I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to uh, have Lenita, who has reached out to me in a lot of different forms, to introduce other people who have a vision out there. And I am so, so excited about this because for my personal development podcast, you are the very first one of my Wakanda people that have come on to this podcast. Now, again, my English language podcast, I've had a plentiful of Wakandans. But today, man, it is me. It is you. So, Mercy, thank you so much for joining. Oh, thank you so much, Yesenia. Love that intro, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the Wakandan people. I think it's so funny because this other, uh, one of my friends from South Africa, who I'm actually going to be visiting next year, she was, she was like, don't start asking me if they're, you know, where's Wakanda and this and that. It's just so funny. You know what I mean? Because people actually ask that. So, uh, oh my God, it's just so funny. So anyways, Mercy, I would love you to give an introduction to everyone out there in terms of who you are. So go ahead. Oh, thank you so much, by the way. Like, you know, but I am Mercy. I am I'm from, originally from Kenya. And um, I arrived in Australia, I'd say, seven, eight years ago. I arrived here in 2012, so you can do the math. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but yeah, so I started high school here, like from year nine, and straight away went to university after that. And in three years' time from uni, got into a job, and I'm a registered nurse, and here I am. Part-time, I do um, wellness sort of promotion in terms of mental wellness mental health so in that i created get real because of my past experiences and what i'd like to give back to the community and to the people so yeah that's what i do nursing and mental wellness Man, <laughs> it's gonna be fan it, it, you know it's funny because a lot of people are like wait but nurses nurses don't necessarily you know you know prescribe you know this you know the prescriptions and whatnot so it's funny because it's kind of like uh, 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 what is it? Uh, a psychiatrist teaching yeah. personal development. That's impossible. That's impossible, right? Because their goal is to get you to buy so you can, yeah. they can suck you into the system, unfortunately. But you being a nurse, you having to get real, going through and trying to contribute and help people or help, you know, support people with what you've been through in the past. But I love the fact that you went from Kenya to Australia and now you're a registered nurse. This, yeah, man. it's just like Elliot. I can't pronounce his last name. Can you help me? Elliot Kip Kipchoge? Kipchoge? Kipchoge, yeah. Yeah, Kipchoge. Yeah. These are leaders of the world. And, you know, just like yeah. Ko Kolisi, uh, the South African <laughs> rugby uh, captain. You know what I mean? This is true leadership. Something that the world is lacking in you. And what you've done, like in terms of going from Kenya to Australia, that probably resonates and inspires so many people back home and just people all around the world in general. So oh, wow. how did you how did you go from Kenya to Australia? Well, I'm gonna tell you something straight up. I'm from <laughs> the village of Kenya, not even anything, from the village of Kenya to the city side of Australia. Wow. Now that's something else. It was to be honest, if I was if I could tell my five-year-old self that I would end up in a place like this, I would be cracking jokes because that ain't going to happen, you know? Because <laughs> I was like, what? First of all, to get on a plane, you know how many times I had to see a plane passing through? Um, oh. that, was, that was like rare. It was very rare. And if yeah. you see a plane, it's probably like, a, like the army type of planes. I see. Or like the goods kind of things. And I was like, what like am I gonna be up there but it was such an experience the first time we have uh, we flew um here was in like the beginning of the January of 2012 mm -hmm. that's when I came to Australia that was such a big thing oh my gosh I was like eating all these things I'm like what are they called I couldn't even pronounce the menu word that was in there it was just completely different language I was like wow well this is gonna be a good kick up my system but it was it was amazing it was amazing i got to experience it with my siblings so we came here together and yeah we pick it up from um high school we just finished our primary school in kenya so the system from um kenya and australia is completely different in terms of schooling 
So what it does is, so they go by class, they say class one to class eight, mm -hmm. and then that's the primary school. And then secondary school starts, they say form one to form four. So that's here, it's year nine to year 12, I instead see. of studying year seven. So um, we had to continue, I had to continue from here. Um, they did, we did a test to make sure that we're still good, but <laughs> I also got the brain, so I was like, I got, I'm like, I ain't going back. I ain't going forward from here. So right. I went from year nine to year 12, straight right. up high school, which was a big adjustment. Right. Um, and then from high school, we were straight away to uni for three years. And yeah, bam. Wow. So, I mean, Jig, you covered so much ground. Like, you know, from you looking <laughs> at that plane, I love it because I never thought about that from that perspective, but I remember watching a movie called Trippin'. It's such a funny movie, right? 20 years oh, I should, ago. I should click that up. Yeah, and I've been trying to look for it everywhere. They're just not putting it out there, but it's so funny. But there was a moment in that movie where you have this, of course, two African-Americans, and he said, I don't know if it was a dream or he was on a ship with his father, and he said that he saw other Black people and they were speaking French. And he was like, I felt like in that moment that I wasn't, you, you, you know, that I was missing out on something. And he was like, I want to come from where they've come, or maybe I could get on a shipping venture out to where they're from so I can learn something new. And that yeah. really ran deep because when I, I remember seeing that in 1999 in the year I graduated too. Then the yeah. year I graduated from high school, that's when I developed a strong curiosity of meeting people all over the globe. And luckily, you know, social media allowed me to meet some folks from Japan which I made my first international friend. She visited me. I went to Australia for the oh. first time in 2009. And two years later, I moved there. That kicked off everything. So just as you were seeing that, you yeah. know, when, and I experienced things in different forms. How did you go from a village, though? So I'm guessing you saw, like, <laughs> you know, you saw things that, Obviously, like me, I'm not able to unsee a couple, you know, some things that I saw when I was younger, like in terms of, you know, unfortunately, kids dying or, you know, this or that, you know what I mean? So you were able to see, you saw all of that, but you didn't become a part of that. Does that make sense? So, I mean, I would love to hear from your perspective, being in that environment. Yeah. So it was completely, completely different because, um, as I told you before, um, in primary school, it was very, very challenging. It's some in some of the closer end to my years in primary school because we did experience bullying with my sister and I. It was it was a boarding type of school, so um, you imagine you you're seeing your parents only one day and you're in school for like three months. So you see them only one day in a very um, timed frame it's more or less like for seven hours or six hours right. and that's the only time you get to see them because then in one month and a half you go home just for like a week or two and you have to go back to school so it was very very difficult and very very challenging and um to be able to experience as well the challenges of living in the village especially in kenya some years there was um this what was it it's called there was something called tribal clashes as well. So that was very, very difficult because um, we had to be very careful. Our parents had to be very careful in sending kids to school because there's no guarantee of them coming back. So it reached a point where we had to stop going to the school that I used to go to. And I had to attend, um, me and my siblings, we had to attend a village school so that it was closer to home, closer to the community where we will still feel safe and we'll still come back home if there is an issue. So it was a big challenge and also going through the poverty crisis as well that was going on in Australia and uh, in Kenya. In Kenya. Um, it was just very difficult. And then um, one time, we reached a point when I was actually, this was when I was in boarding school. So Sundays were my worst days in boarding school because I felt homesick. I was just remembering like, this is what I'll be doing with my family. And then I would look towards like the highlands because the landscape of Kenya is actually pretty amazing. So you can actually oversee some highlands if you're in a big field because there's a lot of fields and all of that. So where our school was, you could see some highlands and some mountains on the very end. And then I was like, oh, my family is on the other side. I'm like, if I could just run or something, you know, that's the 
mindset that I was in. But um, during poverty, like it was very challenging because it was more or less like survival of the fittest. Like, you know what I mean? Like you had, the school was amazing in terms of making sure everybody had a share, even though it was small, they really protected us and they really helped us a lot, which I really commend them for that. But yeah, it was such an eye-opening experience. And I remember one time I was standing in the middle of a field um, and I looked up and I said, what is where like what is a world outside this like is there a world outside my world because that's what i knew i only knew my world like my area where there's poverty where there's tribal clashes where there's all these things that's going on despite all the good things there's also all these things that it's clouding the good things about um my my country yeah and i wanted to know that there should be something good um, outside all these things and I my greatest dream was to go above what I know and that was to go behind like you know you know when they say the sky is the limit my mm. own, I was like thinking I'm gonna go behind and over the top of that limit because I want to see something good that is not what I see now and to be able to come out of that mm. it was a very big challenge it was a a lot of sacrifices that we had to do but God came through and um, um, we came uh, my dad got a job around like in the overseas so he managed to get us over as well um, which is a lot of sacrifices that came on their end as well but we got there and here we are so I give God all the glory so that's why <laughs> wow man yeah I that's why it, you know being able to dive deep into the life, into the shoes of yeah. an individual who had to live in that. But in, instead of you, it's just like me. Like I heard the gunshots like yeah. every night, Las Vegas too. Okay. This isn't, you know, uh, you know, some rural place in, uh, what is it? Rio de Janeiro. No, we're talking about, this isn't the favelas. You know what I mean? This is literally in Las Vegas. And just over those train tracks, I would hear gunshots at least four times a week. For years, for years. I'm talking about for 12 years when I lived in that place, but I chose not to be a part of that. So now your mindset, you being on the plane, you shift into Australia. How, okay, now, did you go with your family or you went alone? I went with my family. Okay, so now you have your backbone there with you. You're like, okay, my family, we're going to go through this together. It's going to be all right. You land. Um, were there, was there any, uh, you know, I kind of want to go back or was there like, okay, let's see what this is about. Yeah. Um, it was more, it was a lot of excitement mm -hmm. because in my mind, I was like, wow, this is a new world I'm getting into. It was more of an adventure really. Like, it was like, I did, I did miss some parts of Kenya, but I knew that this was a new life that I'm, I've been given. This is a new um, experience that I'm about to encounter. And in order to have that full fulfillment or full discernment, I had to commit 100%. So I wanted to be like, no, I don't want to have any regrets. No, I don't want to feel like, oh, I think I'm losing something behind. Kenya will always be the motherland, you know. Kenya is like the roots, you know. It's like for you, like... Be there, you know, um, but Australia was something with opportunity, something that I will, I'll grow into, some something that I will be more than I wanted to be in Kenya, something that I could I could grow and fulfill and flourish as a person, and that's how I looked as um I looked into it as so I was like this is a great adventure I'm gonna give it 100 percent and I'm gonna do it good because. I don't want, I didn't, one thing I didn't want to happen was I didn't want whoever I will encounter to underlook who I am, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because of my skin or because of where I'm from. I didn't want that to happen. I mm -hmm. wanted it to be equal and I wanted it to be like, um, just because I'm coming from this area doesn't mean that I'm not able to achieve this. So that's how I, I looked into that. that so. I love that, man. I'm so glad you said that. You know, I just, this morning, it's funny. Um, it's funny, we're talking like on a Saturday, but this is going to upload like in a, a few days or so. But this morning, I, I finally realized where the root of a lot of things are in Thailand that like that ultimately ended up coming into my life and presenting a bit, you know, it was a big, mm -hmm. it was a big problem. 
Um, for example, you have someone at the age of 45 who is apparently an assistant English professor, blah, 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 at one of the top universities. She said one of her, or she told a story in this little article. In the early 90s, she would go to a place that was famous, let's just say uh, Grand Palace out here in Bangkok. And she was told she was on the lookout for Caucasian speaking tourists who speak English. So now, because of that deep rooted, you know, cynicism or whatever you want to call it from her professor who was born in the 40s, 50s or 60s. Now mm -hmm. that's ultimately being taught to kids in the 90s. And those kids in the 90s are now the parents who said, oh, I don't want my student being taught by a black teacher. I think only white teachers can teach English. Yeah. You see what I mean, so oh. you going through that saying, you know what, it's not, you know, we, we can achieve the same thing. It's kind of like, yeah, I speak the same language just as everyone else in these yeah. native English speaking countries. And not to mention there are probably a half dozen to a dozen African countries whose language is English. That's the first language. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's the national language. So when you get to Australia, what are some of the things that you begin encountering? Because again, we had our nice little short chat, you know, about, you know, depression, about, uh, you, you know, the things that you've had to overcome mentally. And this is why you ended up, get, you know, creating Get Real. So what was it, what did you start encountering throughout school out there in Australia? Big thing was adjustment, like, mm. because we didn't know the, the, um, the system here. So we were used to like, the discipline and I'm talking like the caning and respecting the teachers and you have to like it's more or less like okay. yeah they have that that way of caning but, and yep yeah, that's the one damn, <laughs> god damn but here it wasn't close to that it was more like the first time I heard a teacher say please I was like what like what's going on like we were saying please to the teacher not the teacher saying that to us uh -huh. and then I was like and then in its own, like, it was so, like, chill. Uh, and I was like, what is this world? Like, I was looking at my sister, I'm like, are we, are we, like, are we, like, in a different planet or what's going on? But it was such a big adjustment for us. And um, there was a lot of other challenges that came with us from Kenya. And that led to, as I was telling you before, about the mental um challenges and the mental fight that I was going through, um, depression, anxiety, um, low self-esteem and all of that. It was more like a personal insight into things that I wasn't ready for. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to depression, I would start with the depression because that was a pretty big thing. It was more um, personal based, family based. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the things that I had to let go of and things that I had question of that I couldn't be able to answer at that moment. And also I had like anger management. So I was, I wasn't as calm or as happy as I, as I am now mm -hmm. because of a lot of things that happened back in Kenya and through that transition from Kenya to Australia, a lot of things did happen in my family and a lot of things happened to me. Um, and it was more or less that that was the source of all these um, mental issues and I didn't I wasn't able to deal with that because as I said I did cover myself with a, that smiley face and everybody knowing you as you know you're a smart girl you know you're a book nerd because I, st I created that image of myself with that idea of saying I don't want somebody to overlook to underlook me you know mm -hmm. like I want to be the best I want to achieve the best academically in any way that I can because I didn't want to bring that shame to my family despite all the sacrifices that they went through and so um I was very hard on myself still am but you know it's part of life yeah. <laughs> I was very hard on myself in terms of achieving what I want to achieve and um we did go through a lot of challenges as a family there was a bit of commotion um, which led to a lot of men mental distress, really. And it reached a point where I was down in the downs. Like, I was really, really, really lost in myself and in my own emotions. And I didn't have anybody to pull me out of that area. So 
I was still covering with saying, hey, I'm good. Like, what's good? What's going on? With a big old smile in my face. But deep down, I was screaming. I was crying. I was, I was so lost in my own emotions that I was so blinded by, by my vision and by whatever I wanted to be. I was like, I just want this life to end. I just want, you know, I have no way of getting out of this world until, um, I started hurting people that I love and by people that I love, I mean, my family, I started hurting them and I started bringing um, shame to them. I started, you know, hurting them. And one morning I remember um, the way I was dealing with my mental, my mental um, issues was I was, I loved running. I think it's part of being African. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. You love running. Okay. Yeah. I love running. So I was like running and I, lived, <laughs> I was just running, you know, and I could feel the burn in my quads and the heave of my breath and the tightness of my chest. That was the best feeling I was feeling. And the more I felt it, the more I ran. And my destination was to the beach. Like I loved the beach because it was so calm. You could, you could really transcend whatever it's in you because, you know, when you see it through, you just cannot see the end. And that's the, beauty of it so that was the area I was going to every time and um this this day when I hurt I hurt one of my family members in a very um bad way but I and that when I realized that and I realized like my mom was like full-on like you know covering herself she so she can video it so she can be able to help me when I'm calm because mm. when I'm in that state I was like a lion I could not control myself so mm. I ran to the beach and I realized how bad I had I had become and um I had, did have like suicidal ideation then and I had a lot of things that was going in my head and I was like okay this proves how bad I am this mm-hmm. proves that I am not worthy of being here mm-hmm. and this proves that my family will be happy if I'm not here because I bring wow. trouble to them so wow. it was really really bad and um I felt that my peace is the beach so I should be one with it. So I should bring it all down and just get lost in the in the haze and get lost in the looking over so that nobody will know that I'm here because nobody cares. That was in my mind. And I was at that point I was crying, like I was like pouring down. And then I was looking around and I'm looking at families, I'm looking at how children are happy. I'm looking at how the life is still going on despite what is going on here life still goes on and that was my main thing that I was like okay that that proves it so I started walking towards the shore and um at that time I was not as good of a swimmer that I am than I am now Mm -hmm. so um when the the waves were pretty um it was on a high tide I remember and it hit the it hit my knees and the more it came closer and closer up towards me my panic was more and then um i looked back again and looked what what is the world that i'm leaving and before i look i when i looked back i didn't see this big wave that was coming forward so um it really took me under and rolled me like in i don't know what was going on then and at first for the first time in my entire life in just one second i felt peace i felt the peace that i was longing for peace that I was you know looking forward to but then after that it was like panic rage everything I was like oh my gosh I cannot breathe oh my gosh this and this and I was seeing flashes of life flashes of things that I would miss out on weddings you know birthdays think graduation and all these things and important moments of my of my family that I would miss out on and then one big flash that I saw was of my siblings because I'm very close to my siblings. So I was looking at, oh my gosh, what's going to happen to them if I'm not there? Mm-hmm. And so I cannot remember again what happened after that because what I do remember one thing was something something or someone felt like I was on my shoulder, was pulling me and saying, like, I'm here. I remember that word very succinctly was I'm here. And to me now I can think that was God saying that he's here and he was sort of pulling me out of that. And um, what I can remember after that is I was sitting back on the shows drenched and shaking. I could not remember what, like 
you know, how I got there or what happened. But I remember sitting at the very edge of the shore and looking straight into the mist and something in me was like, I, I knew that word was from God. Like he's saying, I'm here because no, but nobody else was there. And wow. I was like, how is that possible? So it, to me, it was a miracle. Yeah. And then one thing I asked at that moment, because I was so fragile and I was so vulnerable, I said, God, if I'm hanging on a loose thread here, and if that was really you, I want you to send someone to me to yeah. help me rekindle my love for my family, to help me rekindle life, and to help me rekindle my relationship with you. And to me, I was like, it ain't gonna happen. You know, like I was hanging on a loose thread. Like my faith was like washed away, really. I was not longer there and um in time god delivered he sent me a stranger and i did not expect to meet this person in a certain way because we met through music and because i love music so much um we met actually in church through music and um and we hit it off we just started talking and it was very succinct what we were talking about because it was about what I was going through. And it was more in a sense of faith based in saying that God is love and God will always be there for you despite what you're going through. And it was so weird because in my heart, something said, she's the one, she, she's the one that will guide you. She's the one that will, she's the one that God has sent for you. She's the one that you prayed for. Mm. And in that instant it clicked. And I was like, God listened. God was there. And that's, I think that's where my idea of creating Get Real came from, because I know for a fact that I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be who I am if it wasn't for that stranger that God sent me. So that's why I want to be that stranger to all the people that I'm reaching out to. Because they don't know me, I don't know them. But sometimes it might take just a stranger, somebody who who is not connected to your life, to understand what you're going through. Because the people that are in your life may not understand what you're going through. They may not really understand, like, oh, this is it. Like, you know, they, somebody as well, like, you know, who's gone through what you've gone through or something similar. It's much more magical, I'd say, or much more powerful to experience that with somebody else. And that's who I want to be for my viewers. That's what I want to be for my audience, to be that person, to pull them out of their darkness, like what happened to me. Wow, such a powerful <laughs> story, man. <laughs> I mean, I could relate so much to that. That story was very similar to what had happened to Michael Bernard Beckwith who is like, uh, he's the leader of Agape International. He's like a minister or whatever, you know, but he is so, he's so amazing. I love this guy. And I saw him originally on the movie, The Secret, but he said he was swimming out there and he said he swam too far into the ocean and then he was trying to come back, but he couldn't. And then all of a sudden, you know, he had this overwhelming feeling of calm and he said, wow, if I'm going to die here, you know, that this is pretty cool. <laughs> and so he said, no, I'm not going to die. And he said, and he asked for help. Mm. And he said, you know, all of a sudden there were these waves, these ripples in the tide that started bringing him to the shore. And, you know, and he said he went to a lady that was a, I don't know, a palm reader or that, a, you know, Oracle, I'm not Messiah, something like that, right? It was like, the psychic area, I was like, something like that, you know what I mean. And she said, well, when you ask for help, yeah. you know, he, he said that, you know, God sent some angels and they helped you get back to shore. So that's a very similar story. And being that stranger, that is everything, isn't it? Like... When I started going through the problems here in Thailand and, you know, me just realizing a, like a week ago that when I moved here to Thailand, it was in the height of racism towards color people. So mm -hmm. for three years, I was in a country for three years where it was so difficult for all black people because it was harassment from the government, harassment from the police, uh, teachers saying no black, this, that. <clears throat> so... When I finally had that awakening, just as you had that awakening, it was me, a calling for me to go to the library. And I picked up a book, which is still right over there, somewhere over here, somewhere over here. Yeah, it's around here somewhere. And 
that book was Napoleon Hill. And so I started speaking about my experience through that book and related it and say, you know what, this is what I've done. This is what I'm going to do now and giving it like as a lesson. So mm-hmm. all of those strangers and the people who have been listening to me for a very, very long time, you know, yeah. from different parts like Clifton, New Jersey, or, you know, uh, Ashburn, Virginia, these places have been listening to me for three years and they've heard me go from victim to victor. Amen. You know? So, you, you know, you having that awakening, having that, you, you know, what, what did you start doing differently? What did you ask for forgiveness? Was it, uh, of course, this was all mental and things that you were going through in your personal life. When you finally went back to shore and you said, okay, I'm going to go back home. Was it a week? Was it a month? How long did it take you? Or was it just instantaneous? So it took time. It did, took, it did take time. So that day when I came back, I was, I was weak, as I said. Mm-hmm. And I just cried the whole night. Really. Um, mm-hmm. But I did ask for forgiveness. I it was so sincere in my words. And I think because of the love of my family, they somehow understood slightly why I was that weak. And I said, I cannot control myself. And I'm so sorry for, you know, for hurting you. And I'm, I was very, very sorry. Um, but what happened when I came home was, I can remember very well, my mom was sitting on the chair and she had this phone on her hand. And what she was doing, she kept looking at the video that she took on what had gone, how, how, what had gone down. That's why I ran, like how I hurt that person. And she kept looking at it and I could see the sadness in her face. I could see the tears that were rolling down her cheeks. And that was a big awakening for me because it meant I am hurting them. That was the proof to me that I am hurting them. And I needed to grow up. I needed to change that you know i needed to make something so that i don't see that sadness again and so i opened up to her and said look i am struggling i'm struggling with my anger management because i was i could snap but then i could snap like that you know i could just turn Mm -hmm. i was that weak and that fragile and i told her that and i said i want I i don't want this pain to continue because i cannot live like this I would die young if I go on like this. And I don't know how to ask for that help. I don't know what to say if help comes through. That's how lost I was. And some people may not be able to really understand it succinctly, but some may, but that is what it is, you know. And um, in that instant, we started in dealing with, um, my mom had this idea and saying, okay, I'll give you a book. And I want you to write, when you have anger issues or if, when you feel like you're getting agitated, step out of that premises, whatever, whoever is talking to you, just say, just step out of it, just walk out, grab that book and write down, write down how you feel. Even if it's going to be some swear words in there, you write it down. Because we come from a very faith-based um, family. I cannot swear in front of my parents. So I'm like, I'm just writing it all in the book. Right, 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 right. Write it in the book. Be safe, be safe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I was writing it all down. He's like, just write it down and then go for a run. Because that's what she knew. She lo- she knew I loved writing. Write it down, go for a run. Come back when you let down the steam and then just see if you can deal with that issue later by both of par- both of the parties being calm. If no one is calm, let it go. It was very hard in the beginning because I only managed to do it twice and then the other one I was like, went off again but then I was like nah 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 I know it's gonna be hard but it's something that I gotta keep it something I gotta keep doing and then we did have meetings like I think um once a week it started when it was in the beginning it was once a week I had a meeting with my mom just to see how how I'm going you know how how my feelings are what's where am I at in terms of my emotion status um how is how did your week go like in like you know speaking starting to speak out that's how we started and then um i remember in school i was also i did see a counselor at one point because in terms of my academics i didn't want that to start affecting it because it actually did and um the um idea of my family knowing that i'm seeing a counselor was something i didn't want to really tell them but I went to see her and I told her, please let it be between me and you. I don't want my family. I don't even want my sister to know 
that I'm seeing you um, mm. because then they will know how bad I've become. So mm. it was more of an eagle as well kind of thing. And, and she did help me in a way to, to be able to have that courage to speak out. So um, I'd say it started off like that. And then um, I did have a lot of relapses as well, but it kept going and going. And with the help of that stranger as well, I kept in contact with that stranger who became a good friend of mine and still is a good friend of mine. Um, she guided me into speaking more, out more as well. So, yeah. It was a lot of sacrifices, you know, but yeah, it had to be, and, done. It had to be and, done. And I think it, it, it was you having to become vulnerable because you held that in for so, you know, you held all of those emotions in rather than yeah. expressing yourself. Yeah. You know, I remember when I was in sixth grade, I had a substitute teacher and she said that her brother had gone to Vietnam. Her brother had done this. He had done that. Every time you would ask this individual, her brother, a question, mm -hmm. he would always be so humble and so, uh, you know, that, it's not humility, but he would just never speak about it. And guess what? Mm -hmm. He ended up having a heart attack and dying. And she's like, why did he have that? She's yeah. like, because he did not speak it out. And so... I didn't know what that lesson was at the age of 11 years old in 1999, but now yeah. I do. It's being vulnerable. You know what I mean? And so that's why everyone knows. I mean, whoever's been listening to my personal development podcast, they know everything about my family. Oh, were yeah. there shots taken at my family? No, it's my experience. And this is what Lisa Nichols says. This is who I am. You could judge yeah. me all you want, but I know exactly who I am because my opinion matters most. You exactly. know what I mean? So that's exactly what, yeah. the, And as you said with vulnerability, I think it's one of the many things many people don't like to admit that they can be vulnerable. Yeah. And um, because if I link that up to say nursing, we meet people in their most vulnerable state when they're sick, when they are unable to do things, when their ability or their mobility is limited. And actually seeing that they cannot do something, somebody's doing it for them. You can see it in their face. You can see it in how they speak, but it's just that moment of vulnerability that you can actually, I feel you can really reach out to a person in such a powerful way, but not many people like to speak out. Not many people like to say, Hey, I'm not okay. Um, do you have a minute? Or not many people like to admit that everything is not good. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, unless unless you, you know, I don't know if it's happened before. I'm sure it has. But unless you're just having that conversation with someone and you hear someone just over there to your right or to your left or just over your shoulder and they're kind of just like listening to it and then they end up saying, hey, that actually really, you know, I'm going through the same things. And yeah. I wanna, yeah, you know what I mean? Like having yeah. those having those conversations, especially in public. Of course, not saying like all the crazy particulars that, you know, leaving out all the crazy bits, but being vulnerable and having someone coach you in public, you're also coaching everyone else that's around you, you know, just giving just, just 100%, you know, just advice. Yeah. You know, so uh, the, the whole running aspect, you know, <laughs> that relates to me because when I, I had anger problems when I was 15 years old, I didn't know how to control my emotions. Uh, this could be from my mother losing her job to us not having food on the table to us having our powder cut off one cold October night because my mother didn't have a job and um, just a number of different things. And then, you know, two women were involved, like two girls that I liked, yeah, a little crush. And Adriana, she ended up leaving me. And then I liked Maria. Then Maria left me. So when it came to December, I had nothing. And then, you know, my mom sold a truck. There was so many things that happened within that four month period. Yeah. Um, but I remember going into January, I would react different ways. I would scream and literally cry when I lost in a stupid video game called Blitz. It was like a football game. And my mom would say, turn off that goddamn game. What the hell is wrong with you? You know what I mean? You know, yeah. so, and then finally, you know, my mom became very concerned when I got very angry at a stupid university basketball game, watching it on TV. And I told this story before on my personal development podcast. Um, well, this podcast, well, this is going to be on like two different podcasts, but nonetheless, a guy named Manny in my class said, Hey, do you still want to run track and field? I said, yeah. He said, come with me with coach after class. We'll meet him there at six period. 
Went there, Coach Meyer. Hello, Coach. I'm Arsenio. Hey, Ars he's like this guy from Meyer. He's like, hey, Arsenio, how's it going? Okay. You want to go track and field, right? Okay, come on down here. Come to, come to practice tomorrow. And I'm like, okay. And I remember that when we were doing all this practicing and I saw all these crazy runners, I realized that I didn't, I didn't know I wasn't that fast, but I kept at it. Nonetheless, I suffered grand failures. But having that inner channel and reaching out into, of course, track and field, that was when everything changed. So I can relate to the whole running aspect in terms of you releasing that while running. So, oh, my God. Okay, so your ultimate vision for Get Real. Tell us what it is. Tell us what it is you have going on for anyone who is interested. I'll be able to provide all the links down below and whatnot. Uh, but, yeah, go ahead. Share away. Yes. My ultimate goal is to reach out to as many people as I can because I know what it feels like not being, being in that darkness. And I feel like with the people that I've already reached out so far, they want something like this. It's funny because it's not just me. It's not like, it's not just me that started this. This thing has been going on yeah. and it's going on and on and on. Right. And one thing you realize, if I can put um, a Bible aspect into it, is mm. love has been represented in, a, in every time, every time where the word love has been presented. And if you look um, in the gospel, or in the commandments even, the biggest commandment that God states is love. Love is the two main things that he says. Love the God, love God your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second one he says, love your neighbor as yourself. Two is is within love. Love of God and love of man. Mm -hmm. And why is it that is always repeated? Because we still haven't grasped it yet. And it's something that we're all still trying to achieve. And with Get Real, it's a platform that helps you understand self-love. Because in self, if you love yourself first, if you love who you are with all your flaws, with all that you, it is, and what you are, you'll be able to appreciate what God has given you because you're a masterpiece in itself. And also you are unique. And then if you're able to do that, you'll be able to control your mental wellness. Because what happens with mental instability, I always use that word, mental instability, is when there's not love. If you don't love something, you're going to find 100 things to hate that thing. It, be yourself, for example. I hate how I look. I hate how I'm not able to walk that fast. I hate how I'm not able to have long hair. I hate how I'm not able to look like this or be like that. I hate that I'm not in this situation like that person. Same thing with that. You, you disregard the bit of having joy by comparing yourself with people. Have you ever heard this theme that says comparison is the thief of joy? Because many people like to compare themselves with other people. I've done that myself. I've been like, man, I, I wish I could be like that. You know, like, I wish I could have that. I wish I could do that. Right. But what about what I have? Because mm -hmm. you, as your, you as a person are a whole earth. You are a whole world because there's something that you can give to this world that nobody has ever done it before. That's why they ain't another senior. They mm -hmm. ain't another mercy. It's only that one person. Yeah. And you contribute a certain thing in that world. And that's what I want to present and get real to make people and help them understand the importance of self-love and it impacts in mental wellness. And um, some, it, I feel very... Um, it's a very um, passionate thing I really have in my heart because it's amazing when you finally grasp that very well. I'm still learning. It doesn't mean that I've got there. I'm like, hey, mighty greatly. No, I'm still learning myself. The people that I meet, the people that I talk to help me to understand more on the different aspect of self-love, what it is, how do you get self-love, different recipes of self-love, and how can you... How can you grow in showing that love to others? Because if you start loving who you are, you will reciprocate that to the people that you meet in terms of the people that you bring into your life, the positive stuff that you let yourself see, listen, and hear. It all starts with love, loving yourself because of what God has made you to be. And that's what Get Real really is. 
That's a beautiful thing, man. I love that so much. Man, it's such, see, this is why, boy, this is why I love my Wakanda people. You know what I mean? Because it's such, it's so deep rooted. It feels like we all venture out on this journey, like vicariously with each other. I'm like, it doesn't, uh, it's, I just love it, man. So, oh my God, I'll be sure to put this in the description. For those of you, again, I'm going to put this on my English language podcast too. That one has a giant audience. And it's because uh, I know a lot of people in these countries, because there are like 80 countries that listen to me over there. They, I know they know someone or maybe they're going through something similar to what we have been through. You know what I mean? And so it's going to be on all platforms, YouTube and whatnot. The links are in the description guys in terms of this and, Mercy, it's been a plum pleasing pleasure, man. Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is my first podcast. First oh podcast, baby. God. That's right. That's right. God <laughs> damn it. And you know what? I think she's one of the very first. Or no, no, you're probably. I had someone from Guinea. Uh, <laughs> Guinea, as a matter of fact. I don't even know what part of Africa that's in. Probably the West. West, West. Yeah, see, I knew it. Uh, and I had him on my podcast. Um, to talk about the things he's had to overcome living in Malaysia. You know what I mean? But he speaks like four or five languages and he's doing amazing things. It's just, I, you know what I mean? And so to bring my folks on from the motherland, it's just, I can, we, we know, we feel that same, I, I don't know what it is, but the bond, you know what I mean? I, 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 don't, don't get me wrong, everyone. I have bonds with everyone else, but see that Wakanda bond, you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> Oh, oh it's just so funny i just love saying that it's just funny <laughs> but anyway so uh man again mercy thank you so much for coming on and for those of you who are interested and i know you will be links are in the description you can reach out to her in whichever link you find suitable and uh please give her a shout and join the community so again mercy thank you so much yeah. Thank you for having me, Asin. It's been a great pleasure meeting you and talking to you. It's been good. You're very, very, very welcome. And same here. So, guys, uh, stay tuned for more, man. I'm your host, as always, over and out.